Barack Obama makes history by becoming the first sitting U.S. president to visit the memorial site at Hiroshima. Japan's prime minister says this moment opens a new chapter between the two countries. But is there more to it than that? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Martine Dennis. President Obama has become the first sitting U.S. president to visit Hiroshima in Japan. That's one of the sites where the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb during the final stages of the Second World War. And now, more than 70 years later, an historic visit. Japan is calling a new chapter in relations. Al Jazeera's Harry Fawcett has more now from Hiroshima. It's a journey that President Obama had reportedly wanted to make for years. Now, within months of leaving office, the 44th President of the United States came to the town which the 33rd President, Harry Truman, had ordered destroyed, almost unimaginably, with a single bomb. His tone was stark and somber, conscious, it seemed, of the weight of this moment, of his own presidential legacy. But we have a shared responsibility to look directly into the eye of history and ask what we must do differently to curb such suffering again. There is a symmetry at play here. In the first few months of his presidency in 2009, President Obama made a speech in Prague in which he called for an end to nuclear weapons in the long term in the world. He's chosen the last few months of his presidency to make this symbolic trip to Hiroshima to call for the same thing. A message echoed by Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who urged the world to ensure no repeat of Hiroshima or Nagasaki could ever happen. Earlier, they'd met survivors, visited the museum dedicated to the horrors they'd suffered. President Obama tried to put them in the framework of what he called humanity's core contradiction between progress and a base instinct for conflict. The scientific revolution that led to the splitting of an atom requires a moral revolution as well. The president made no apology, but his focus on morality was a political risk. Many historians, many Americans believe the bombing was morally justified, ending the war early, saving more lives than it claimed. Emiko Okada's 12-year-old sister was one of those who died. Emiko was eight. She remembers the flash, the heat, the gruesome deaths. In Prague, Obama used the word moral responsibility. I thought then he understands. I wanted him to make a speech after feeding the atmosphere of Hiroshima, to say we need a world without nuclear weapons. That he did, but some point out he came with a launch code to a nuclear arsenal that's being renewed, not dismantled. Obama's policy of modernization, uh, which is pledging a trillion dollars of spending over 30 years in the United States to modernize the nuclear arsenal and its delivery systems, uh, runs exactly counter to a desire for a world without nuclear weapons. For many, though, this day was about symbolism, about a recognition of a devastating, destructive power and the will for it never to be used again. Harry Fawcett, Al Jazeera, Hiroshima, Japan. All right, let's bring in our panel now. Joining us from Tokyo is Yoshike Mine. He's a former director general of the International Relations Department at the Japanese Ministry of Defense. In Beijing, we can talk to Jia Zudong, who is a senior research fellow at the China Institute of International Studies. And from Loughborough in the UK, we're joined by Taku Tamaki, who's a lecturer in international relations, specializing in the Asia Pacific region. Welcome to you all. Um, Yoshiki Mine, can I start with you in Tokyo? When the two men, President Obama and uh, Prime Minister Abe, talk of this new relationship, this new chapter in uh, in U.S. and Japanese relations, what do you think it means? What defines it? Well, um, first of all, I'd like to uh, mention two points uh, of importance. Uh, th these two points are related uh, uh, to some extent to, to the bilateral relationship between the United States and Japan. But um, the first point I would like to mention is the uh, 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 President o Obama's visit to, uh, to Hiroshima, uh, its significance 
to the uh, process of elimination, elimination of a nuclear bomb. Um, as everybody knows, uh, uh, President Obama has been very active and uh, uh, proactive uh, in the uh, uh, elimination uh, of the atomic bomb uh, uh, and the, the, uh, in, the, in the first stages of his uh, uh, career uh, uh, administration. He uh, uh, made a very uh, encouraging speech in in, in Praha. Uh, well, it is yeah. all known. Uh, so uh, can we can we come to that? Can we come to that? Can we come to nuclear okay. non-proliferation in just a little while? First of all, I'd like you to define for us, well, if you would, hmm. uh, what this new chapter in U.S.-Japanese relations consists of. How do you define it? Well. Um, the uh, President Obama's visit to Hiroshima is a historic occasion, uh, uh, never uh, 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 took place before. Uh, so uh, it, it uh, well, m m many people, many people in Japan and other outside Japan well, did not think that it, it would be possible that the President of the uh, United States which uh, dropped uh, the, drop, uh, the, the, the atomic bomb 70 years ago, uh, can visit uh, Hiroshima. And so it is a, a very symbolic sign of the new relationship between the two countries. And Taku Tamaki in Loughborough, how would you assess this uh, reboot, if you like, of the relationship between Japan and the United States? Um, I generally agree with the, the previous speaker. Um, it's difficult to say whether any significant change would come out of this. Uh, having said that, I think um, President Obama visiting Hiroshima itself is really an endorsement of Prime Minister Abe's policy. So that is, that's, I think that is the significance. As I said, I'm not too sure if any new changes will happen after this. I'm not too sure, and especially with the presidential elections coming up, um, as we just need to wait and see. And uh, Jia Zudong in Beijing, how is China, how is the, the government in Beijing viewing uh, not just uh, the events in Japan over the last couple of days, but also uh, Obama's visit to the region, his 10th his visit to Asia since he assumed the presidency? Uh, President Obama uh, has uh, you know, uh, adopted a uh, rebalancing to Asia kind of strategy and uh, would like to increase U.S. Uh, inputs uh, politically, economically, strategically, militarily into the region. So uh, he has made several trips to uh, uh, Asia, and this is the latest one. He's trying to improve relations with Vietnam and also strengthen its uh, alliance with Japan so that uh, the United States can ask these countries help in its uh, rebalancing to Asia strategy. And of course, uh, with this kind of strategy, uh, the United States uh, hopes that its uh, presence in this region will be strengthened uh, compared with, uh, you know, uh, against the backdrop of the ri uh, rise of China. Well, President Obama's visit to Hiroshima is just the latest in his push for diplomatic strength in Asia. Earlier this week, he lifted a U.S. arms embargo on Vietnam. It had been in place for almost half a century. That will allow Vietnam to buy weapons from the U.S., one way America provides military support for smaller countries in Asia. Now, some say that the increased U.S. leverage in the region is really to bolster resistance to Chinese territorial claims in the South China Sea. So, gentlemen, uh, let us assume then that uh, President Obama's pivot to Asia is one of bolstering uh, the other countries in the region against what uh, has already been described as a rise in China's strength. Can I go first to you, uh, Jia Zudong, in Beijing? D does Beijing see this as a counter push to the growing strength of China? Uh, of course, the United States, you know, um, has uh, 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 interests in the Asia Pacific, and uh, the, this region is uh, growing very fast in economic terms. So, when the United States would like to, uh, you know, expand its trade with the region, it has to uh, develop relations, closer relations with countries in this region. So, as it really has uh, needs to develop economic ties. At the same time, it would like to strengthen its military uh, presence in this uh, 
region so to support its uh, uh, advantages uh, for power in this uh, region. Of course, uh, uh, all, with all this, there is an element of uh, the China factor. That is, the United States actually views the rise of China as kind of uh, competition. And so it's trying to make sure that uh, uh, its presence will not be threatened by the rise of China. Of course, for China, uh, it is growing, uh, but it also seeks uh, constructive relations with the United States. Uh, you know, it doesn't want, you know, it has no intention to drive the United States out of this region. The United States and China uh, have shared interests in this uh, region. And Yoshiki Mine in Tokyo, how does Japan, how does the Japanese government feel about uh, the growing tensions in the region, given that the stated aim of uh, Shinzo Abe and President Obama has been uh, a, an increasingly likely world where there are no, uh, there's no nuclear weapons, but what we're seeing in the region is increasing militarization, I would suggest, and increasing tensions. Well, um, the, um, it is true that uh, this area, uh, region, um, in this region, the, uh, there are certain changes, uh, including some development in the nuclear areas. Uh, uh, and certainly, as uh, was pointed out by Mr. Chia, uh, Chinese uh, presence, Chinese growing power is also uh, one of the uh, major uh, factors uh, to influence uh, the situation in this region. Uh, but I think, you see, the, uh, between the United States and, and China, and between Japan and China, there are uh, collaborations. There are also uh, different differences of views, different uh, uh, positions. But there are also uh, uh, areas where two countries, three countries can cooperate uh, uh, one, one another. This is an important aspect. So as Mr. Cha uh, pointed out, the uh, American uh, strategy of rebalancing uh, is uh, certainly quite related to the growing power of China. But uh, uh, President Obama is also aware of the fact that uh, for us, uh, all the countries, uh, including the United States, China, and Japan, uh, we have to cooperate one another anyway. The, otherwise, uh, we would be in a worse position. And Jia Zudong, what do you make of the recent Pentagon report suggesting that China is preparing to arm submarines with nuclear warheads and send them on patrol? This most definitely would constitute a, 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 a ratcheting up of tensions in the region if this were to be the case. Uh, I don't see uh, that way. You know, compared with the U.S. military power, uh, China has fewer advanced military aircrafts, uh, nuclear-powered uh, submarines. And even with uh, you know, an increasing number of uh, advanced military equipment, China still keeps its uh, uh, you know, military power uh, defensive. So of course, uh, it, uh, as a major power in the world, uh, it has to develop a kind of deterrence against any kind of uh, major threat uh, in, in the future. So, uh, but that being said, still China, you know, uh, doesn't uh, use this kind of uh, military power against any specific target or any specific country. It is only a way of uh, uh, deterrence, a way of uh, uh, defense. And also there is, you know, a dialogue on security. Uh, between the two militaries of the United States and uh, China. So uh, th there is also, uh, the two can have worked out uh, rules of engagement on the high sea. So I don't believe that the presence of Chinese military power will be any uh, kind of a threat to any specific country. And Tamu Tamaki in Loughborough, is China, is it fair to describe China as feeling insecure by U.S. missile defense plans uh, to extend its uh, system for missile uh, deflection to South Korea, ostensibly uh, to protect it about, uh, get from any kind of missile launching from, uh, from its northern border? Is that reason to make China feel insecure? 
<laughs> I think it's really a matter of mutual misperceptions. I think on the one hand, I think we do have to take seriously the Chinese concerns about uh, what it sees as a potential containment of China. Uh, there are historical reasons why the Chinese are very nervous about territorial issues and indeed uh, about any sense of uh, hegemonic um, containment of China. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there is a um, sense of misperception on the side of the US alliance, including Japan as well, uh, in looking at what uh, China is doing. So it's really about um, mutual misperceptions, and it's also about a uh, lack of communication, perhaps. And it's a, having uh, some kind of a hotline would be a good idea. Having some kind of a communication line open between Beijing and Washington is always necessary, as the previous uh, speaker mentioned. But I think it, what it really boils down to is both sides trying to find out what exactly the other side is doing. And I don't think In I'm not too sure if the the conversation is going well at this point. Indeed, because there have been some close encounters of late, haven't there, between the Chinese and the US navies. Indeed, uh, it was almost a throwback to the, um, the middle of the 1990s. And it's one of these things where even neither side intends to cause havoc. Uh, these mistakes happen, uh, miscommunication, miscalculation. And if and when there are collisions, uh, what happens? Is there enough of a trust between the two sides and indeed the wider alliance to, to prevent um, significant events from emerging? And Yoshiki Mina, add to the mix, you have uh, a Japan that is reviewing its position in the world, uh, trying to push aside or to grow out of its traditional pacifist uh, position in the world and seeking what some describe as a more robust uh, military uh, uh, position. I mean, add this to the mix and you do have uh, perhaps a, a dangerous situation in your region. Well, um I have a sort of a mixed feeling because um, if I look at uh, what the government, Japanese government, is doing, maybe what you have pointed out uh, uh, is, is quite relevant uh, because the uh, present uh, Abe uh, cabinet, Abe uh, administration government uh, uh, made the new legislations, new uh, security related legislations, which make the self defense force to act in other side, uh, in other places in the world. But um, I, I personally don't think this is a sort of a trend uh, of Japan. Uh, uh, I wonder if it is uh, quite limited to the present administration. Uh, once we have different administration in the future, uh, I wonder wh whether we may go back to the uh, f former position which you uh, described as pacifist. Um, this is also very, uh, uh, very difficult to point whether the, uh, the Japanese position in the past uh, should be called pacifist or not. Uh, well, uh, all, the countries, all the countries tend to be pacifist. Uh, and Japan is certainly one of the uh, countries uh, which most strongly uh, advocated for the Pacific uh, pacifist uh, uh, positions. But um, uh, the, 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 the reality uh, is something different. And uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, self-defense force can now uh, act in other places uh, than, uh, than in Japan is, is certainly an important element of development, but um, I, I must be clear about uh, what would happen in the, in the future. And Jia Zudong, um, Beijing reacted uh, fairly angrily to the G7 statement in which it uh, expressed concern about the situation in the East and South China Seas, and it called for respecting freedom of navigation and resolving conflicts peacefully through law. China not mentioned, but it's very clear who that part of the statement was aimed at. Well, uh, you know, uh, the uh, G7 members are not parties to the uh, disputes in uh, South uh, China Sea. As for the dispute uh, in the East China Sea, uh, China and uh, Japan uh, actually should seek settlement of the dispute through uh, diplomatic uh, means. Uh, when the G7 you know, talks about the freedom of navigation, and the tension in the South China Sea. Actually, uh, China sees uh, this kind of move as a way of trying to uh, uh, you know, drive a wedge between China and other claimants in the South China Sea, actually make the situation uh, more complicated. 
Um, China believes that the, the G7 and the countries beyond the region, outside the uh, South China Sea uh, region, should leave the claimants, uh, direct parties, uh, you know, for their settlement among themselves through diplomatic uh, means. And actually, that is exactly what China is trying uh, to do. And China will seek, uh, you know, peaceful solution. And uh, we'll talk with this uh, uh, country in the, in the region. Actually, in the past few decades, China has enjoyed friendly relations with all these cl other claimants in the South China Sea. So China is confident that, uh, left alone, uh, China and these countries can find a way, uh, a solution. At the same time, they can, uh, you know, focus on areas of uh, mutual interest and cooperate with each other in key areas uh, of mutual interest to all of them. Uh, Taku Tamaki, uh, what do you think the impact will be on the region uh, of this lifting of the arms embargo on Vietnam. It's been in place for almost uh, 50 years, and uh, this is something that President Obama announced uh, when he, he was in Vietnam, Vietnam on this particular Asian trip. What effect might this have on the tensions in the region? I, would, I don't really know what wider effect it would have in the intermediate to longer term, but I think it would give a particular signal to the Chinese, and going back to the earlier point about the sense of containment, and as you mentioned, the statement, uh, the G7 statement, along with uh, what is effectively an endorsement of Prime Minister Abe's uh, policy by President Obama for visiting Hiroshima, um, I think it sort of shows and re-emphasizes the American position on pivoting back to the Asia Pacific, although some people would say that uh, the, uh, the United States has never really left. So it's not so much a pivot back to the Asia Pacific, but it's just um, sort of a restatement or, or sort of reasserting its position and its interest in maintaining status quo, and perhaps as a result of that might, just be, and might end up sending signals to China to say that, well, we're not happy with, with your eyes. Again, it's all about perceptions and misperceptions between the, the two superpowers now. And Jia Zudong, uh, what does China feel about the US so-called pivot? We're using the language of, of the administration, of course, here. What does China feel about this, this, uh, this re-energizing of its uh, focus of attention, if you like, on, on the region? Uh, is it more meddling, or does it see it even as provocative? Uh, actually, uh, pr uh, initially, the, uh, the U.S. Uh, the Ob Obama administration put too much emphasis on the military aspect of its uh, rebalancing to Asia and has uh, tried to uh, strengthen its alliance uh, system and build uh, new partnerships uh, in the region in a uh, military uh, area. So that actually has uh, uh, in a kind of uh, uh, make, uh, you know, bring complicating factors into the situation in the region. Later on, the United States realized that uh, too much emphasis on military will do disservice to its interests, its goals of, uh, you know, uh, of, in, uh, of uh, uh, a more uh, presence, building stronger relations in the region. So later on, it's tried to uh, stress more on the economic side and political side, but still, uh, the United States says, uh, you know, still stresses a lot about the military aspect of its uh, rebalancing to Asia, which really has made the situation in the region more complicated than in the past. Okay, gentlemen, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Jazu Dong, Yoshiki Mine, and Taku Tamaki, thank you all very much indeed. And as ever, thank you for watching. You can see the program again anytime you like by going to the website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, should you want it, you can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And there's always the Twitter sphere. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Martine Dennis, and the whole team here in Doha, it's bye for now.